Hello, welcome to Challenger Tabletop. I'm Christopher, and this is another Paint and Chat live stream. A little different than usual. I don't have any show notes prepared, but I do have a subject to talk about, so we'll get into that in a minute. And uh, I did just finish a long day of construction in the rain again, so I'm kind of tired, and I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. I just uh, got home, whipped up a pizza, scarf that down and then I had about maybe 10 minutes to get ready for uh, live streaming. So I tried to get a video ready of the miniature I'm going to be painting but it wasn't exactly ready so I'll just show them off uh, on the painting cam. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at those. So switch into the painting cam here. Hope it's working. Yep. Yeah. All right let's get that centered. And today we're going to be working on some aberrants. So these are um, for Warhammer 40k and they are for Gene Sealer Cult. And these are basically the big tough bruiser melee fighters for Gene Sealer Cult. And this squad is equipped with the huge hammers or mining hammers can't exactly remember what they're called seismic hammers. Anyway, uh, they've got power hammers basically. And a lot of them are holding them with three arms. Uh, I turned the hammer around on this guy like he's getting ready to hit someone with the uh, pick end of it. And here's the last one. So that's what we're going to be painting today. Uh, maybe we can get a little more, a little better light on these guys. Uh, let's see. I think that looks a little better. Uh, let's take a look at the one I really uh, did customize quite a bit here. So this is the leader of the Aberrants. Uh, I think he has a special name, but um, it's escaping me at the moment. Anyway, he does have a hypermorph tail. It's like an extra weapon he gets to fight with, in addition to his huge hammer. And I uh, used a different uh, bit for the tail, and I created this kind of armor plate on the top of it. And uh, just to create a bit of a uh, difference from my other squad leader for these guys, here's what the hypermorph tail normally looks like. So it is have kind of a barb on the end or a, a spear or a talon, what would you call that? A spike. So I tried to do something similar here, but more stretched out using a bit from a Tyranid. I'm not sure which one it was. A, one of uh, some bits that my friend uh, Mortimer dropped off for me. All right, so uh, let's get painting on these. And I thought for the topic today, I would talk about uh, some of my favorite um, 
narrative games or narrative missions that I've played uh, in Warhammer 40k. So if you have the desire to play narrative 40k or create your own missions, hopefully these will give you some inspiration. I'm just going to talk about some of the ones that I've uh, come up with with my friends uh, that were fun. And my coffee's ready. Plunging my French press here. Need a little something to recover after working about eight hours in the rain. I had to warm up my hands a few times today in the car just to keep going. But I do have that feeling of a job well done. Got some good exercise. Got some fresh air in the rain. <laughs> Hopefully I don't come down with a cold. That's happened a couple times now. All right, well, I think we could get a little more centered, but let's go ahead and start painting. Uh, I like to get going with some uh, Screamer Pink on the uh, skin. And I'm gonna be using this on the head and the hands and anywhere it looks like uh, there's no armor plates, basically. And I do have an Abominant to paint. He's kind of like the hero version of these guys. But I thought it would be helpful to go ahead and paint the regular squad members first. So that I would get a sense of where exactly all the colors are going to go. So let's dive in. Oh, I keep uh, meaning to move my paint water over to the far side of the desk so it's not right next to my microphone. We can put the coffee over there. So narrative games in 40k. Uh, I guess I'll start out by just giving my sort of narrative game philosophy for any who aren't aware of it. I've been playing a narrative campaign for probably over five years now. And I consider it quite a success that it's gone on and attracted players and people have stuck around and kept playing. And so I feel like I'm doing something right. And basically my philosophy for narrative campaign is to mostly play just match play games uh, because they're the most fair. And uh, of course this started long before Crusade was a thing. But because I feel like match play works so well for, cam uh, for a narrative campaign, I wasn't attracted to uh, Crusade at all. I kind of feel like Crusade adds a bunch of rules, but rules don't necessarily create narrative. Uh, granted, the Crusade rules seem like they're trying to create narrative, but um, they just seem totally unnecessary and... Uh, ninth edition is already overcomplicated enough, I would say. So I just felt like there's no reason to go uh, into Crusade. So uh, I play matched play, and generally we don't uh, create any bonuses for the winners or penalties for the losers. Uh, for the most part, every match play game is just, um, well, uh, sometimes we do play like a series of, you know, best of two, best of three play five games, whatever, but um, generally each individual game is just a good old match play game of Warhammer 40k. And uh, as for the narrative, generally uh, it's all set in one kind of campaign world or campaign star system that I created at the outset of the campaign. And if we have some kind of stakes for the game based on the narrative, they affect the campaign world, but not the players and their armies, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, if your leader warlord dies in a battle, you can bring him in the next battle. There's no, you know, units permanently dead or permanently eliminated or anything like that. No recovery time for slain units or characters. But, um, there will be, uh, you know, pretty regular and constant effects on the campaign world based on who wins what game. So we might play, you know, for instance, we played a best of five, I think, uh, for control of a, a moon in the campaign system, uh, Transcendence Moon. This was a series of games between uh, Black Legion and Dark Angels. 
I was playing the Dark Angels and basically I was trying to protect the planet and Black Legion was trying to conquer it or the moon I mean and so uh, we had sort of set up the stakes that whoever won the most games in our five game set would conquer the moon and then um, sometimes you know we add some extra little rules like uh, I can't remember if we did it this time but uh, basically Abaddon was leading the uh, Black Legion army and I think he fought in every game if I remember which was partly uh, tactics of uh, you know my opponent liked to use Abaddon but also it was a way to kind of make, give the games some feeling of uh, you know uh, it sort of fit the narrative that Abaddon was leading the attack and sometimes we will arrange beforehand that we're going to play three games in a row and we're not going to change our army list in order to make the narrative feel uh, more consistent. Make it feel like the same army fighting one battle after another against, you know, a different army. Sort of like a one long running engagement. But um, we don't always do that. And sometimes we'll do kind of a version of that where we'll say um, you have to keep your army list the same, but you're allowed to swap out two units from game to game. So if something was really not working or you want to try to counter your opponent a little better, you have at least some flexibility to do that. I did already paint these guys' bases and the rim around the base uh, beforehand. Figured it wouldn't hurt to get a little bit of a head start on uh, my speed paint of these guys. And we're also going to be batch painting them, so I'm going to see if I can work on all five of these uh, aberrants at once tonight. And see how far we get. But nice to finally be able to relax, chill out, do some painting, talk about some 40k. I think my voice is pretty well recovered from last week. I had kind of a cold. So we'll see how long we could go. Maybe we could get these guys totally finished. That would be nice. Hopefully I'm staying centered on cam and in focus. Can't look at the screen and my miniature at the same moment. <clears throat> so first of all, I would say that, um, so I would say the heart of our narrative campaign is having a campaign map. That way before the game, whoever seems like they would be a more fitting uh, aggressor for the game could pick where they're going to attack and the other person could be the defender of that planet or moon or space station or what have you. Uh, or sometimes, you know, if someone's like brand new to the campaign, you might ask them, hey, you know, where, where do you think your forces would go when they entered the star system? And then that's where I'll attack you. So you don't have to have the attacker pick the battle location necessarily every time. And uh, I was going to give kind of a summary of our game so far in the system uh, from live stream. And uh, I'll mention the last one that we played uh, was just uh, yesterday. Yeah, I uh, played yesterday against Mark and his uh, Templar. They're using Black Templar rule, but he uh, rules, but he called them, um, or Codex. But he's named his uh, chapter the... Templars of the Broken Shard and kind of uh, his idea or narrative idea for his uh, Space Marine chapter is that they operate in remote regions of the galaxy which totally fits for uh, our campaign setting. The Icarus system is supposed to be kind of at the edge of the uh, uh, what is it called? Segmentum Pacificus or something like that? But uh, basically over on the far western edge of the galaxy and uh he decided, uh, he, he said uh, his guys didn't just arrive in the system. They've been here for like a hundred years. This is their, uh, they've been assigned to protect one of the installations in the system. So he picked uh, Icarus 4, which is kind of like a desert planet. And its only feature was a secret weapons lab. And uh, because the planet only had really one interesting feature, we'd actually never played a battle there in five years. So it was quite exciting to 
uh, have the first opportunity to fight a battle on a new planet that uh, has been in the campaign lore for a long time but never used. And uh, Mark actually brought over a desert battle mat to use for the planet, so that was really cool. We'll have to uh, fight several more battles there and get him to bring it every time. That would create some fun feeling of uh, consistency, sort of visual consistency. But uh, Mark uh, gave me a, a, a sound defeat. Uh, as Mark uh, was playing his Templars against my orcs, and in the previous game, my orcs uh, crushed or tabled uh, Germans' uh, sisters of battle. Got revenge, actually, on his sisters of battle as they uh, beat me soundly in our first uh, practice game. But uh, uh, Mark uh, did beat me with his um, Templar soundly, which uh, basically for the narrative, we had worked out that that means that he successfully defended the secret uh, weapons laboratory and the orcs haven't figured out it's uh, located there yet. But I like that he had that idea that his fleet uh, or his Space Marine chapter uh, is basically really good at scavenging their own weapons and repairs and kind of jury rigging their vehicles and salvaging armor and equipment from the battlefield. So I noticed he had like one of his veterans wielding like an orc chain sword and uh, stuff like that. He had some uh, jet packs that were from like uh, Dark Angels or Blood Angels chapter. So I thought that was quite cool. And I think it'll be pretty fitting for his uh, Marines to be stationed on Icarus IV. Uh, it's really a planet which uh, doesn't have many uh, much infrastructure available to Space Marines. So it kind of makes sense that he would have to uh, kind of uh, scrounge his own equipment and repairs. And uh, let's see, so that was just yesterday, and then before that I played uh, our first game on stream successfully versus German, and his Bloody Rose Adeptus Sororitas. And it was my second game against the Sororitas, so the lore that we, or the narrative that we had worked out was that his uh, Sisters of Battle had landed on Icarus II, which used to be a sort of a farming planet or agro world. But uh, during Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade, the Black Legion attacked the planet, bombed most of the infrastructure, and then abducted most of the civilians. So ever since then, it's been a really basically a ruined planet. And it's been slowly rebuilding over the last uh, 100 years. But it's basically reverted to being like a feudal world. And it just doesn't have the population or infrastructure to support the worldwide mass scale farming that uh, it used to be uh, known for. Uh, looks like he's got a metal uh, collar around his neck with a chain hanging from it. And he has some little sort of lumps or nodules on his chest. Kind of like he has going down his back. So, I think maybe I'm going to paint his back like it's uh, armored. So, most of that will be white. I guess he have, has another little muscle fiber area here. So, for our first game, we figured that uh, German uh, Sisters of Battle had recently arrived in the Icarus system. And they were in the process of building a chapel or a monastery, uh, whatever it is that uh, Order of uh, Sisters of Battle will build. And um, my orcs were already fighting on Icarus II, so they basically attacked this new construction where they detected some activity going on. And uh, in the first battle, the sisters um, defeated the orcs, but that only basically encouraged the orcs to try harder 
and come back with a better game plan, which they did. So in our second game, that was the first one we streamed, and uh, that was where I did manage to defeat uh, German uh, in turn four. And so we had kind of decided that we were gonna play, or I, I had suggested, and he, he accepted, to play a three game set uh, representing the orcs attacking his uh, monastery. So since he won the first one, we figured that construction probably proceeded or maybe even uh, completed. So the uh, Sisters of Battle have built themselves some big uh, fortress monastery basically. And now we're gonna play a three game set where the orcs are attacking it and the orcs have taken the first game so that kind of raises the stakes for um, for German. Uh, as uh, we haven't exactly decided what will happen if the uh, orcs win all three, but I did suggest maybe uh, maybe his sisters of battle. If the monastery is destroyed, they'll basically be operating without a home or who knows what. Maybe operating out of the Imperial Fist space on, uh, on the planet. Icarus 2 has a... Sub subterranean Imperial Fists uh, Mega Fortress slash Gene Vault. All right, so there's my first um, aberrant. This arm on his back is actually from a Gene Stealer. I had a few extra Gene Stealer arms sitting around, so any of the aberrants that only had two arms, I went ahead and added a third one. So they've all got three arms. Just thought that was fun. Well, uh, that's the Screamer Pink, and we're gonna be doing this to uh, each of them and see how quick we can get through them. Uh, it does look like maybe he has some armor plates on his forehead, which I, I suppose I should have left white because that's kind of my armor plate color, but eh, I don't know. Just kind of figuring it out as we go here. Oh boy, this coffee's good. Got my Stonehenge cup. And I'm drinking some Starbucks espresso, uh, really coarsely ground and uh, brewed in a French press. And it's still nice and hot, tastes great. I uh, got used to drinking black coffee somewhere along the line. Used to love uh, more like uh, vanilla lattes and stuff, but I worked at Starbucks and over time I got to like the actual taste of the coffee more and more and try to drink less and less uh, milk and sugar. So here we are drinking black coffee these days. I still make lattes pretty much every morning but um, I also love uh, Americano or regular coffee. So uh, I did play one more game recently that was intended to be streamed and we were trying to stream, but uh, I it was my first time streaming on the laptop and I picked the wrong setting and it did all it did was a bandwidth test for three hours while we played Warhammer. And um, yeah, really sorry about that. But it would have been our first live stream game and that was against Dominic and his Eldar. And one of the house rules uh, I've been playing with is Imperium versus non-Imperium, uh, for the most part. So um, if someone brings a non-Imperium army, I'll usually play my Dark Angels. And I do finally have another Imperial army I'm working on. That's going to be Imperial Guard, but they're not quite um, ready yet. Um, actually, they were uh, Gene Stealer Cult Brood Brothers that I had enough of them, and, and uh, many of the options went away for Gene Stealer Cult. So I'm going to change them into an Imperial Guard army. Very much looking forward to that. And it will give me some more uh, options. So if someone brings non-Imperium, I can choose uh, Imperial Guard or Dark Angels now. But um, against Dominic's Eldar, I decided to play in, uh, my Dark Angels, uh, sticking with the uh, Imperium versus non-Imperium rule. And uh, with the narrative we came up with was really fun. And if you're looking for a narrative for Eldar versus Imperium, where the Eldar can be kind of the good guys, but the Imperium are also kind of good guys, I think you could take some notes on this um, uh, narrative we came up with. 
which is that uh, so this was a game set on Icarus 2, which is the recovering agri world turned feudal world. And the narrative that we came up with was that the Eldar, led by uh, sort of a proxy Eldrad, had um, basically foreseen that this planet was going to turn to the Gene Stealer cult and that the infection was going to arrive on the planet aboard a uh, supply uh, ship loaded with tainted medical supplies, probably sent from Transcendence Moon, which is totally taken over by Gene Sealer Cult in the same uh, system. And so basically the Eldar had detected that these medical supplies were tainted through their psychic uh, foresight and they were showing up on the planet to attack the medical supplies and destroy them and prevent the planet from being uh, infected. Uh, meanwhile, the Imperials, my Dark Angels, were basically trying to protect the medical shipment, thinking that basically these were critical supplies and need to be protected and having no idea of what they really contained. And perhaps um, the uh, sort of foresight went as far as knowing that if they simply told the Imperium that the medical supplies were tainted, they either wouldn't be believed or it wouldn't be enough to stop the infection. So not, ha not wanting to rely on the uh, Dark Angels or the Imperials to... Uh, take their word for it that these supplies were tainted, they showed up to attack and destroy them. So uh, it was really fun sort of narrative because it felt like the uh, Eldar were technically the good guys trying to save the planet, but the Dark Angels also, you know, were like doing what they thought was the right thing. So it was kind of like two good guys fighting each other, but uh, I thought that the narrative really made sense for that. And uh, Dominic actually defeated me handily. So he, uh, he did win, which meant that the Eldar destroyed the medical shipment and the planet was saved from Gene Stealer Cult infection. So very fun and exciting game. And uh, in this case, the, having that narrative behind the game, it really like lessened the blow of losing badly to him. You know, it was like uh, I had something to be happy about. The planet was saved. And uh, I've certainly lost quite a few planets and moons, uh, especially to Abaddon and his Black Legion over the course of the campaign setting. And there was even one game where we straight up destroyed the planet in advance of the game. It was going to be against Typhus and uh, a mostly Death Guard army, uh, painted as Black Legion, so it was kind of participating in Abaddon's Black Crusade. And uh, this was an attack on Icarus 3, which is a um, hive world. So basically a world with many hive cities. And uh, we just decided, okay, let's say that uh, the whole planet has been infected by Typhus's uh, plague virus or a zombie virus, basically. And um, it was just like a, a fun way to add some excitement to the setting and take what was sort of a relatively boring um, hive planet and make it more interesting by giving it uh, swarms of zombies. And I don't think we actually had zombies on the table in the game, although we could have. I have uh, the old bag of zombies uh, miniatures, but um, in that case it was just like uh, more like a way to make Typhus seem scary and exciting to say that, you know, he had already basically ravaged slash destroyed this planet at the outset of the battle. Need a little more coffee. So very fun game against Dominic. Uh, and I'm looking forward to playing at least one more game against him. He's planning to uh, uh, travel overseas for uh, military deployment. So I won't be able to uh, play too many more games against him before he heads out. But 
really fun to get to know him and to get at least one game under our belt and hopefully a second one. And uh, he did a great job um, on his uh, Eldrad uh, kit bash. He did a, a basically a kit bash proxy for Eldrad Ulthwan and he had a custom name for him and uh, it was really cool. He had like a sword flying around uh, sort of like he was psychically controlling the sword and making it fight without even having to hold it. And he used some 3D printer resin uh, that was kind of like stretched out into a string almost to support the sword and have it flying around. And it looked like basically, you know, like when you have speed lines behind something that's flying really fast, you know, kind of like um, that Yanari character with the flames. So uh, that was fun, fun game against Eldar. And uh, I haven't really gotten to play Eldar very much. So it was cool to have sort of the two noble factions going up against each other, you know, Space Marines and Eldar and, and come up with a fitting narrative. That was, that made me happy. But uh, let's see, what are some other narrative games that we've had in the Icarus system? Uh, I'll go back to one of the first ones we played was um, uh, against um, Black Legion, I think. Uh, or was it Tyranids? I know we played one game where basically we were trying to recover a canister containing some Tyranid DNA. The idea being that uh, with their DNA, uh, the Imperium could develop uh, some kind of bioweapon against them. And I don't think I successfully retrieved it, so that story kind of storyline kind of went out the window a little bit. And that kicked off a series of games against Black Legion. And so, uh, in our search for some sort of narrative inspiration, we just went to the sort of Games Workshop lore and figured since um, my friend was playing Black Legion and uh, led by Abaddon. It must be part of Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade. So it just kind of made sense uh, to kind of tie our own narrative games into that pre-existing sort of storyline. And that can be really fun to do, uh, to basically relate the narrative of your game to the existing Games Workshop lore or the current Games Workshop lore. So that was before the uh, Primaris Space Marines and Gilliman waking up and the galaxy being uh, split in half by the Great Rift. Uh, all of that came sort of after we had started our campaign. But uh, our first games were basically focused around Abaddon's Black Crusade. And then eventually uh, my opponent Mortimer uh, made a Tyranid army and we worked the Tyranids into the campaign setting. But the first several games and, and many of the most memorable games in the uh, campaign were fought uh, Dark Angels against Abaddon's Black Crusade. And uh, for the most part, Abaddon got the edge over the Imperium. Uh, he tended to win most of the games where he was personally present on the battlefield, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, so uh, the Abaddon's Black Legion fleet uh, abducted the population of Icarus II, the farming world, agri world. And they also abducted the population of Transcendence Moon, which had been like a shrine world, garden world, sort of pleasure world, I guess. Uh, and although it's a moon, not a planet. And uh, I guess as I mentioned, Typhus as part of uh, the Black Legion um, War, or the 13th Black Crusade, they basically uh, infected Icarus III with uh, Poxwalker virus, I guess, and basically destroyed it, turned it into a plague world which has been more or less off limits to the imperium ever since so actually that was the last game i think we played on icarus 3 would have been that one against 
uh, Typhus. And um, actually, uh, my Dark Angels defeated Typhus in that game, if I remember correctly. And so I think that might have been why my opponent decided, well, that's enough for him. We'll move, go back to Abaddon. I guess Typhus was sent, uh, sent running or licking his wounds. If I'm remembering right, it's been quite a while since we played those games. And uh, uh, we have played some very memorable custom missions, which is kind of the topic I wanted to talk about today. And let me see which ones I can remember. So uh, one that was very cool was where there was a battle on a, of a, on a hive planet, I think. It might have been Icarus 3. And, or maybe it was, maybe this was actually a battle on Icarus 2, part of the campaign where uh, eventually Abaddon kind of conquered the planet. And the uh, Black Legion was sort of bombing the planet from orbit. That was kind of the narrative background of the battle. And the battle was going to be played on city terrain. And so kind of going back and forth, talking before the game, working out what the narrative could be. Uh, we came up with a custom mission uh, based around the narrative that we came up with, which was that the hive, where the or hive ruins, where we were going to be uh, playing our game or fighting our battle, had just been bombed by Abaddon's fleet from orbit. So that's why basically all the ru buildings were ruins on the table uh, or on the board, and. The reason that the city or hive city wasn't fully destroyed and the reason that Abdon's forces had come down to the planet's surface was that, uh, or at least a, a sort of a scouting party had, was because uh, the bomb that was supposed to destroy the city had failed to go off. So we called it a hive killer bomb. And I think that might be something that exists in the lore. But basically, the premise of our game was that the uh, there were five, I think, five or six, and maybe there were six craters on the board. So this was our custom mission, was that there were six craters on the board, and only one of the craters contained the hive killer bomb that failed to go off. So uh, neither player or neither army was going to know which crater contained the important bomb until moving a unit onto it. And each time we'd move a unit onto a crater, we would roll a dice, and if we rolled a six, we had found the hive killer bomb. And if we searched five craters without finding it, it would automatically be located in the final crater. And that is actually what happened during the game. So, uh, very exciting game. Each time we'd uh, move onto a crater, we'd get to roll a dice, and we were constantly being disappointed. And so, uh, ultimately, the, uh, oh, I see, they have some uh, muscles visible on their legs. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the game, it was a Chaos Helldrake who ended up uh, sitting on the bomb and holding it until the end of the game, which was the win condition. Basically, if uh, Chaos could hold the, uh, find the bomb and hold it for three turns, it would go off, or else it would go off at the end of the game. And if the Dark Angels could find it and hold it for three turns, they would defuse it. So that was the uh, custom mission that we created. And it was very fun. So that's my first uh, custom mission uh, I wanted to bring up. Basically, um, six craters. And each time you enter a crater, you roll a d6. And when you, if you roll a six, you found the Hive Killer Bomb. And one side is trying to defuse it by holding it for three turns, uh, defusing it and ending the game. And the other side is trying to set it off by holding it for three turns. And if the game comes to an end uh, after five turns, whoever's holding that bomb wins. And if neither player finds the bomb and holds it, then you uh, go to, you know, uh, the winner is the person who has models left or... Uh, go down to points or something like that. So that was a fun one. And then another uh, fun game we played was part of the campaign to 
uh, capture or defend Transcendence Moon. So Transcendence Moon being basically the place that all the sort of wealthy hive nobles would move to was considered basically a very, and also a shrine moon, was considered a very important place to defend for the Dark Angels. Uh, and so we fought, I think, a five-game set uh, series, Black Legion versus Dark Angels, for control of Transcendence Moon. And uh, a lot of our narrative was kind of based on the fact that all these wealthy hive citizens live there, or sort of VIP, Imperial VIPs. So um, we figured that, you know, basically the hives were like super deluxe, and um, the Imperium would basically spare no effort to try to protect the, the populace and the, pl and the moon. And um, so again, we figured that the attack probably began with Abaddon's fleet bombing the planet from orbit. And so the next game that we played after the attack had begun, I think, uh, we figured that the hives had been bombed and a bunch of wild animals that had been kept like in zoos, sort of exotic animals, had been set loose. And specifically, uh, several green dragons. There's really no reason that dragons can't exist in the Warhammer 40k war universe. So uh, I had some dragon miniatures that I had uh, found or uh, purchased for Dungeons and Dragons and we're going to use them basically as like wandering monsters on the battlefield while we played our game with the idea being that they were running free after being broken out of their cages by the bombing so some dragons on the battlefield and this was um, this was before the change from like ballistic skill used to be a number that translated to what you needed to roll and nowadays ballistic skill is like and weapon skill are just like two plus three plus but it used to be that like ballistic skill i think five or six meant two plus i know marines were ballistic skill four and they had to roll a three up to hit so it used to be like ballistic skill four meant three plus and bliss skill five i guess would mean two plus etc but um we use that uh for the i guess that will come into play here when i tell you how we did these um dragons but uh they weren't related to the objective of the mission we were still using like a mission out of the rule book but we just had these wandering monsters as like a way to add some fun narrative excitement to the game and there were a bunch of different sizes of dragon. I think there were four or five different sizes. So basically we figured the uh, easiest way to do it would be to have the smallest dragon have stats that were all three. So weapon skill three, ballistic skill three, um, although it didn't have a shooting attack. Uh, three wounds, toughness three, you know, leadership three if it came up. Uh, so basically it was like threes across the board and then all of the dragons had uh, the same uh, armor save which is like a five up I think but uh, so the smallest dragon had stats that were all three the next bigger one had stats that were all four and then the next bigger one had stats that were all five and then I think we even had one that had stats that were all six that was like a giant dragon and uh, so uh, so we created these or we, we created stat lines for these wandering monsters. And then we had to have some kind of behavior figured out for them. And we wanted to keep it all like something that you roll every turn on a D6 and see what they do kind of thing. So uh, basically we figured that I think in the, if something was within 12 inches, uh, they would like charge it automatically or something like that. But, um, otherwise you'd roll randomly to see what they would do uh, from turn to turn and uh, they weren't gonna start on the table instead we would 
Um, I think we would roll randomly for each one to see if it appeared on the table each turn. So it was possible that there would be no dragons in the game even after we did all this effort to write the rules. But in fact, we did have a few of the dragons show up. And uh, I remember one of the tougher ones got into a multi-round fight with a uh, Chaos Obliterator. So that was kind of fun and exciting. Added a little uh, randomness to the game that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So um, as for how their behavior worked, um, when they would first appear, the only place they could appear would be inside terrain. And then, uh, so basically for each, I forget if it was for each, I think first we'd roll to see if they, if each dragon appeared or not. Maybe they only appeared on like a six, but there were multiple of them, so you'd get multiple rolls each turn. And then if they appeared, I think there were six ruins, so we just would roll a d6, and that would tell us which ruin it appeared in. And then, um... I suppose if there was nobody in range to charge, nobody within 12 inches, something like that, then you'd roll randomly for its behavior. So it was either going to like move toward the closest unit or it was going to uh, maybe move a random direction using a scatter die, which uh, maybe some people don't <laughs> know what that is anymore. Uh, but um, uh, I think that was mostly it. It would either like move toward the closest unit or it would move randomly. And I think those were kind of like the two things it would do. And it worked. It worked out quite well. And it was fun and very memorable. Unforgettable game. Partly because of that extra little something that we came up with. But uh, that theme that sort of like stuff was set loose during the attack on uh, Transcendence Moon and kind of got loose into the wild uh, became kind of a theme in several of our games after that. As we started including more and more Death World forests, which uh, were something I think goes back to 7th edition maybe. Uh, basically, a Death World forest is a, a terrain piece that you can take cover behind like a forest, but uh, it has additional rules where it can inflict mortal wounds on uh, nearby units uh, depending on a variety of factors. So there are several different kinds. Um, the sort of most tame is the, uh, well, I guess the, there is one, one good kind of... Uh, Death World Forest, which is an Eldritch Ruin, and it gives you, uh, I think, plus one to cast Psychic Powers if you're within an inch of it or touching it or something like that. And then the rest are all bad, but the most innocuous of the bad ones is Shardrak Spine. Looks like this guy's got a boot on one foot. So uh, Shardrak Spine, if you uh, advance or charge within three inches of it, it has a chance to do a mortal wound to you. Uh, to the unit just one mortal wound on I think like a roll of a six and then there's uh, Barbed venom gorse, which is similar, but uh, more dangerous Will inflict a mortal wound within three inches uh, if you advance a charge on a roll of a five or six and then by far the scariest was grapple weed uh, which uh, we used a few times and it was always like, uh, I think I usually ran it, ran afoul of the grapple weed. So uh, grapple weed could basically move toward the closest unit if there's anything within 12 inches of it. And then once it uh, gets next to a unit, it starts doing mortal wounds. So it basically, uh, and it can't be killed. So it will go moving around the battlefield. It will sort of see something and start chasing it down and it can be quite hard to get away from for like a regular infantry unit and i remember one game where uh, grapple weed really did a number on one of my whirlwinds and another game where it really uh devastated on eliminator squad so uh those are death world forests you can still find the rules um in on wahipedia or uh, I think in, you know, I'm not sure exactly which uh, rule book they were in. Maybe the index, I can't remember. But um, yeah, 
definitely a lot of fun and there's no reason that you can't use them in 9th edition. The rules for Death World Forest are uh, pretty easy and you just got to find them or make up your own. But uh, basically uh, we figured that the um, hostile plants got uh, were, were probably being kept kind of like the dragons. They're being kept by some nobles on Transcendence Moon as kind of like a curiosity or uh, kind of like a, you know, pet plant kind of thing. But after the bombing, they got loose into the ecosystem and just proceeded to uh, multiply like crazy. So that's kind of the idea there. And I'm thinking that uh, both of these ideas ought to come back uh, in our games on stream. No reason we can't uh, do Death World Forest or Wandering Monsters again. Both those were really fun. This guy doesn't seem to have an exposed elbow. Uh, maybe he does. I'm going to paint it like he does. Just put a little dab there. Probably need a second coat of Screamer Pink on all this stuff I'm painting. Uh, I think I should do his tail with uh, Screamer Pink. I keep uh, moving like I'm going to dip my uh, paintbrush in my coffee. Better not do that. Hopefully I'm not that tired. Alright, let's paint his tail. This should be fun. One thing that um, I guess I haven't quite figured out is what would be good rules for a horde of zombies on the table as wandering monsters. Because you'd want to make it so that it doesn't, you know, in, I, I guess the rules I like to make are ones that equally inconvenience both players. So, uh, you know, maybe the zombies are attacking Chaos and Imperial alike, for instance. And that way you don't have to, like, charge anybody points for having them on the field and you can stick to basically standard match play rules and standard missions but you just have some kind of extra added complexity I think probably do it kind of like the kind of like the grapple weed where they just um Maybe they stay stationary, and then if something comes within 12 inches of them, they move towards it kind of thing. And if they can get next to something, then they attack it. You could have it be mortal wounds. But uh, you could just have, give them regular attacks, or have even have them have like Poxwalker stats. But um, I think it could be interesting to have a game where the players were kind of mowing down zombies at the same time that uh, they were having to fight the uh, enemy. We've got to do that if we fight a game on Icarus 3, which is the death world. I think that would be really cool. All right, is that good enough on the tail? I think we missed a little spot there. Okay, that's the, uh, I wonder what the leader of an aberrant squad is called. Um, is it called an abomination? Or is that the uh, hero HQ version? Or is he elite? Well, I haven't used these guys yet, so I'm not super familiar with them. So uh, toward the end of Abaddon's Black Crusade, right after he had conquered Transcendence Moon, I asked uh, my friend uh, Mortimer what um, he wanted to do next. And he said, uh, well, or basically asked what would Abaddon do next, you know, now that he's conquered the planet. And he said, uh, well, actually, I think uh, Abaddon uh, might uh, see some Tyranid ship coming and evacuate like jump back to his fleet and get out of here so that, oh that's interesting because uh mortimer's uh painting up his tyranid army and he was excited to get it on the table so it seemed like a cool way to introduce it 
And it was nice, you know, kind of cool of him to, uh, you know, right after conquering the planet, be like, oh yeah, I don't even want it. Let's uh, give it back and and, all, uh, and now the Tyranids can fight over it. Just, um, you know, uh, I guess that's the thing. When, when the narrative only exists to sort of entertain the players, you don't uh, have to be too tied up or uh, you don't have to worry too much about holding on to your territory or whatever else you would in a game that was more like uh, Crusade style. So uh, he said, yeah, um, what if there's like Tyranid ships start crashing down? So I, uh, we kind of settled on one Tyranid scout ship that was like the size of a skyscraper coming down and crashing onto the planet's surface. And we figured that after it crashed down, it would start sort of absorbing into the planet or growing like roots down into the planet. So um, he did have, finish his Tyranid army and we started using that. And we fought several battles kind of based around the scout ship on Transcendence. So uh, I think the first game might have been like Dark Angels approaching the ship to attack it and then we played a very memorable game where the Tyranids and Dark, Elder, Dark Angels were fighting uh, against each other both inside and outside the ship. And this was an exciting kind of um, setup for a game that again might be good inspiration for some people. Where we had two tables set up side by side. So in this case, we had our standard six by four table, and then we also had like a small narrow coffee table. And we we're gonna fight the battle simultaneously on the two tables. And one was gonna represent the forces inside the Tyranid ship, and one was going to represent the forces outside the Tyranid ship. And so this was again a custom mission that we came up with. And what we wanted it to represent was that the forces, the Dark Angels outside the ship were trying to secure the exit so that the troops who went in wouldn't be surrounded and flanked from behind and would have a safe way to get out of the ship after accomplishing their mission, which I believe was to actually destroy the Tyranid ship by planting explosives or something like that, uh, or maybe a uh, gene virus or something. Uh, and then, so that was basically the objective of the troops inside. So for the troops inside, basically, I think they had to make it into the Tyranid deployment zone in order to plant the explosives. And that ended up being a bridge too far. I could not manage it. And maybe that mission was too hard to have to advance onto the side of the table of a melee assault type army like Tyranids. Uh, that's a pretty tall order for uh, Space Marines, especially shooty style Space Marines like my Dark Angels. Uh, but um, we did use a mission like that for Abaddon one time, and he did successfully uh, take the Dark Angels side of the table, so can be done. But uh, so the mission that we came up with was basically divided board and on the table inside the hive ship, the Dark Angels had to make it into the Tyranid deployment zone by the end of the game, I guess. And on the table that was representing outside the ship, we had marked one area, one board edge, that was going to represent the entrance to the Tyranid ship. And so uh, I think basically whoever controlled that entrance at the end of the game would win that, t that side. So uh, as, it, as it worked out, um, my Dark Angels were able to successfully hold the entrance to the Tyranid Hive ship, but they were not able to advance into the heart of the hive and plant the bomb. So it was kind of a suicide mission. Uh, everyone who went into the Tyranid ship died, but the guys who stayed behind outside did, uh, I guess, live to fight another day. So the Tyranid Hive ship was not destroyed as a result of the game. And uh, the Tyranids went on to somewhat infect the planet and basically figured this is like a long range scout ship, which 
you know, puts down roots and starts calling out to the rest of the uh, Hive fleet to come take a planet, but that the rest of the Hive fleet might be hundreds or thousands of years away, so it's hard to say exactly how long it will take before they show up. Um, looks like I could paint the back of his knee. Hey, welcome TMIR94. How did Deep Strike work in those missions? Uh, I think it worked normally, but I didn't think of it to uh, Deep Strike into the heart of the Tyranid ship. That would have been a much better strategy. I should have rolled in with a bunch of uh, Terminators. Somehow I have a feeling my Terminators were sitting outside the ship trying to secure the exit. But lessons learned. Uh, but anyway, Divided Board can be a fun um, style of custom mission. Uh, another one I've done before uh, is playing on board a spaceship. And I think the way we did that was we used the board from Space Hulk, the board game, which basically has uh, rooms and hallways and we arranged kind of a spaceship with multiple uh, ways to get between the different rooms uh, kind of shaped like um, kind of like shaped like a square I think roughly and I can't remember if that game was played uh, simultaneous to action happening on the surface of a planet or if we just straight up played a game that was set on board a spaceship but that was fun uh, it runs into the problem of bottlenecks where basically um, when troops are fighting in a hallway only about two models will be able to get into um, what do they call it uh, you know uh, fighting range and so there was definitely some bottlenecking going on but that's kind of part of what you expect if you're going to be fighting on a spaceship. Engagement range. Thank you. I'm pretty tired from uh, doing construction today and my brain was not functioning. So yeah, not many troops could get into engagement range. That's kind of the problem with uh, playing on board a spaceship. But uh, especially if you have a lot of hallways to pick from, uh, make it so that... Um, You don't necessarily get totally stopped up if one hallway is blocked. Uh, it can be an interesting way to shake up the standard game of 40k. What are some other ones we've done? We've done so many cool uh, custom missions. Uh, uh, TMIR, uh, have you done any fun uh, custom missions? Have you been playing 40k very long? Or do you play 40k? I remember we did one that was uh, based on, uh, oh, no, only for about a year. Oh, cool. Uh, we've been doing this um, narrative campaign for about five years, so we've played quite a few interesting missions, and especially back in the day before 8th and 9th edition, we would uh, come, come up with more custom missions. And um, I would say that there's definitely a place to come up with custom missions again nowadays as the 8th and 9th edition missions are all kind of cookie cutter a bit. You know, you're either holding one objective holding two or you're holding two holding three. And you've got some kind of custom secondary and sometimes you've got some custom mission rules. So it's kind of like uh, once you've read through all the missions, you kind of have the idea of how they're designed, what they all kind of have in common. Uh, I think it's not too hard to make up your own nowadays. And uh, it's part of the fun of playing a, like a narrative campaign is that if you feel like making up some crazy rules or some uh, kind of custom mission, usually, usually the other player will be down for it. Oh yeah, I remember what I was going to talk about next was uh, sort of the next time that my Dark Angels approached the Tyranid uh, hive ship. So uh, we had a break in the campaign and 
I think maybe we had only gone a couple months without playing, but it was around the time that Games Workshop had advanced the narrative. Uh, TMIR, the main difference are the deployment zones. Yeah, good point. Uh, but uh, even with the deployment zones, it seems like there's only about, usually only about three or four different styles. You could always just pick one of those or take inspiration from those and make custom deployment zones for a mission that makes sense. And I have noticed that there's some missions besides the uh, match play in the rule book. And I think some of those are like attacker defender uh, type deployments. So that could be interesting. I've seen missions before where one person deploys in the center of the table and they're trying to escape or hold out. So that's uh, an interesting option I've seen uh, done a few times, but I don't think I've ever played a mission like that where one person starts in the center. Could be fun. Might be something to put on my to-do list. But uh, the next time that my... <clears throat> Uh, TMIR. Uh, should I call you TMIR? Is there an easier way to say that? Uh, I'd guess with custom stuff you can go wild too. Yeah, you can. I try not to go too wild. Uh, I try to stay kind of faithful to the matched play, you know, keep things as fair as I can make it. And if there's something custom, try to make sure it um, inconveniences both players equally. Although sometimes one player will like the custom stuff more than the other just because they play a shooting or melee style army. Uh, sometimes that will uh, affect how bothersome certain rules are. Like, uh, for instance, the Death World Forests tend to um, not be a big deal if you have a shooting army because they are usually only triggered when you advance or charge next to them. So they do maybe a little bit unfairly uh, inconvenience a player who's got a melee army who wants to be constantly advancing and charging every turn. Uh, but uh, then again, some rules I've seen that have like, uh, I think there's a custom mission. I mean, I mean a regular, regular mission in ninth edition where there's a mission special rule that um, if any unit advances and they roll less than a three, it counts as a three. So something like that, I think it's called forward push mission. Uh, something like that would actually help a uh, assault army because uh, like a low advance roll early on in the game could be uh, kind of inconvenient for an army that's trying to get into melee, trying to close. Uh, so um, one of the next custom scenarios we played uh, now I think we did use regular missions for this but it was like a fun narrative scenario was the uh, battle for survival so I guess uh, I'll just say that um, around the time that Games Workshop advanced the lore of the game oh Tamir would be the usual way okay thanks Tamir uh, around the time that Games Workshop advanced the lore of the universe and introduced the Primaris Marines and the Great Rift across the galaxy and Gilliman waking up uh, we had taken a break in the campaign a bit maybe it had been a month or two a couple months and when we we're getting together for our next game uh, I suggested what if a hundred years have passed in the Icarus system. So we uh, sort of advanced our own narrative a bit and figured that uh, the planets that had been ravaged by Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade had been either left in ruins for a hundred years or had been gradually recovering for a hundred years. And so the uh, Transcendence Moon, which had been more or less abandoned slash evacuated, uh, we figured that uh, the hives that had been not been destroyed would have probably been taken over by gene stealer cults. And although there was some Tyranid presence, we were going to sort of do the hand wave that um, the gene stealer cults were still independent of the hive mind. The hive mind hadn't become strong enough on Icarus or on Transcendence or in the Icarus system yet to take full control of all the uh, Gene Sealer cultists. So they basically had their full control of the moon for a hundred years. 
and during that time they like multiplied into the thousands if not the millions in the various hives and to some extent they were able to sort of recover or loot the uh, imperial supplies that had been left on the planet so uh, I ended up starting a gene stealer cults army sort of inspired by that or based on that and that's what I'm painting these guys for so these are the gene stealer cult of transcendence and they're uh, set on transcendence moon and they sort of rule the planet still to this day uh, and then so we figured that transcendence moon had basically devolved from being sort of a pleasure world to being almost like stone age technology whatever imperial citizens had survived and not been infected by the gene stealer cult had fled out of the hives and were now living like cavemen or like Ewoks or something out in the forests in like tree houses with uh, basically no technology. And uh, so it was in this context that the Dark Angels had returned to the system after a hundred years and were going to try to approach the Tyranid scout ship and basically appraise its current situation. Figure out is it still there? Has it changed? And what's going on with it, basically. Oh, hey, uh, Tamir. Uh, well, as long as the NIDs don't get enough absorption organ structures set up, I'd say it's unlikely they would integrate the cults into their bio clusters. Well, glad to have some backup for our <laughs> for our lore. So, um, I had also started to paint uh, Primera Space Marines, and I had begun the process of trying to transition my Dark Angels force from uh, Firstborn to Primaris. And I had gotten the, uh, what's it called, the, uh, like the Phobos set, the Vanguard Space Marine box set. And I had gotten them all painted up and I was excited to see them in action. Uh, but I did paint them kind of like uh, a bit unusual way. I like the idea of infiltrators being like wearing black for stealth. So I had painted my Phobos Dark Angels uh, in black armor, but with just one green shoulder pad with the Dark Angels insignia on it, chapter badge. And so the from a sort of a lore point of view, that's not a very good thing to do because the Dark Angels... Um, don't really let just anybody paint their armor black. Uh, only the Ravenwing fights in black armor. And the fallen Dark Angels, who they're trying to hunt down, wear black armor. So, uh, and then add to this the fact that the Dark Angels don't fully trust the Primaris. Because uh, they don't know the Dark Angels' secret. Uh, that part of their brotherhood turned to chaos during the... Uh, Horus Heresy. So put all this together and probably the Dark Angels in the Icarus system would not be too happy with these uh, Primaris who showed up. These sort of bigger, stronger, better, newer Primaris. So uh, I got kind of a kick out of deciding that they would be sent on suicide missions. Uh, Tamir, I personally would prefer Firstborns, especially the gear options for the tax seems funner to me. Yeah, that's true. Tactical squads are a lot more interesting than uh, intercessor squads. And you know, something that I think would make intercessor squads a little more fun would be if they didn't have to all change their weapon to the same thing. Because uh, intercessors have about, I think, three different like bolter options. Uh, probably like a stalker bolt rifle or a hellst... Hellstorm bolt bolter, Hellstorm bolt rifle. Anyway, they have several options of bolter, and the way it's worded on their data sheet, it almost makes it sound like any of them can change to any of the bolter, and you could have a squad of mixed weapon. But I think that would make them a lot more interesting. Uh, Tamiri, yeah, they always have the heavy, rapid fire, and assault weapon option. So I think it would be cool if you could ha if you could mix and match those within your squad of intercessors. I think that would make them a lot more flavorful. 
because then it would be like, you know, you might have just like the one guy in the squad who carries an assault weapon and, you know, he's like the gung-ho guy who loves to charge or, you know, advance. And so if the whole squad does advance, then at least that one guy is going to be able to shoot his assault weapon. Uh, so I always thought that would be neat. Uh, someone said they were pretty sure that the data sheet was written to allow that. I'm pretty sure it's not, but I think that that would be one small change that Games Workshop could make that would make Intercessors a little more fun and a little more flavorful and like uh, a little more cool in that way that tactical squads are. Uh, to mirror, that would be nice, like having that one sniper that has the special helmet mark. Yeah, totally. And um, it would kind of help you like do the narrative bit a little bit because it, you know, you'd be tempted to like name the sniper in the squad or you know whatever. Uh, at least if he got an important kill on an enemy HQ, you know, it would make it more more exciting, more flavorful. So uh, with the sort of idea that um, the Primaris were being sent on suicide missions and that their first mission was going to be to approach this Tyranid hive ship, scout ship on foot in the jungle and check it out, investigate it. Uh, it's kind of like the Dark Angels were trying to get rid of them and if the Primaris were going to survive, it would have to be in spite of everything that the... Uh, Dark Angels are doing to try to get them killed. So uh, we ended up playing a three game set based on this uh, sort of scenario. And the sort of premise for the battle for the set was going to be the battle for survival as these uh, Primaris are sent on a suicide mission and basically try to survive against the odds fighting against uh, Hive Fleet Tyranids. So, basically, uh, we did random missions. Uh, something we like to do usually is roll for a random mission out of the rule book or uh, one of the chapter approves or the, um, what do they call them now, the Grand Tournament 2020, 2021, whatever. So we were rolling for random missions, so we didn't actually play custom missions. But uh, it was a fun scenario, and we did use the Death World Forests because this was now returning to Transcendence Moon after 100 years, and it's been overgrown. Uh, Tamir, uh, hey guys, how about knocking at the enemy's main base, <laughs> main base's uh, main door? Yeah, exactly. Have fun. I heard they like it if you roll yourselves in butter beforehand. Pretty much. So we figured that the closer that they would get to the hive ship, the more the uh, hive mind would focus and become aware of them and start tracking them, uh, sending out scouts to patrol and find where they are. So the first game that we played, uh, my Dark Angels lost. So from a narrative point of view, we figured from that point, they're going to be retreating and trying to escape and get to extraction. And uh, basically, they weren't going to be able to be successfully extracted unless they could win the next two games. And if they had all died, it's not like I never would have played uh, Phobos Marines again, but presumably that whole force of, of Phobos Marines would have been wiped out. That would have been kind of the narrative result. So not a whole lot at stake, nothing that at really at stake in the campaign world per se, but... Uh, sort of uh, just the actual army itself. And I suppose if they had won all three games, they would have uh, reached the Tyranid Hive ship and attacked it or something like that. But since they lost the first game, we figured they went into immediate retreat and they're now trying to fall back and make it to extraction. And they make it to one extraction point and the Dark Angel is like, oh no, we can't make it down there. You have to fall back further. Here's your new coordinates, you know, something like that. So it's just getting like harder and harder for them to make it out as the hive fleet or hive mind is like becomes determined to surround and catch them and destroy them, basically. So that was a fun uh, three game set and uh, 
against the odds, my Phobos Marines managed to win games two and three to come back and win the series two to, or two to one. So we figured that they survived and they escaped and they got extracted back to space. And uh, the Dark Angels had to grudgingly admit that these new Marines are very hard to kill and uh, probably uh, gonna be a valuable addition to the chapter after all. So they kind of proved themselves, which uh, I think the Primaris Marines have generally proved themselves uh, across the galaxy. That's my impression. So that was fun. And um, I like, I really like playing multi-game set. Uh, I think we had, uh, so part of the custom scenario that we came up with was that uh, neither of us would change our army list at all for all three games. So that was quite interesting. And then to lose the first game and know that I couldn't I couldn't improve my, or change my list. I simply had to rely on the fact that I had more experience playing against his list and had to just play better or get more lucky or whatever to defeat it. So that, that ended up being uh, quite fun. And it felt good to be able to turn the tide and win games three, uh, two and three after losing the first one without changing the list. So that was cool. He used an army that had a bunch of, uh, I think they're called uh, biovores, the ones that launch spore mines. So it was like just a constant barrage of spore mines, if I remember. And uh, he's using like a flying hive tyrant and and also I think a huge swarm of uh, zoanthropes spitting out tons of mortal wounds but I was able to sort of improve my strategy and uh, come back to win this second and third game and you know it is also fun to do something like that because it can kind of prove the people wrong who say that the winner of a game is determined by the army lists and you know it's all just army lists because then you're literally playing the same army lists and you're gonna see that the results don't always stay the same. So there's definitely luck involved, definitely skill. But uh, the stakes of playing, you know, best of three, best of four, uh, five, or, or make, I find they make games quite exciting. Uh, had a fight with a hive tyrant. The biovores are uh, probably difficult to deal with if you have to get a specific point on the map. Yeah, I almost never killed his biovores because he would just keep them back out of sight at his table edge, pretty much. And meanwhile, everything else in his army is charging at me, so I'm not usually able to go hunt them down. And I did end up giving away my um, whirlwinds, which normally would be a, a good tool to attack something out of line of sight but uh, that was part of what I did with my um, firstborn is I uh, gave him away to people who didn't play 40k to try to get him into the game and so sometimes I've been successful sometimes not so much but um, the guy who I gave the uh, um, whirlwinds to did did pick up 40k and he plays against uh, one of my friends now so good deed and made some more room on my shelf for Primaris I did uh, the thing that's kind of fun where uh, for the leader of my Primaris Phobos Marines I uh, kind of tried to make him look kind of like myself <laughs> I don't know if you have ever thought of doing that but uh, uh, I guess I should ask what faction do you play Oh, and which Hive Fleet? Yeah, okay. So Tamir, I'm um, asking which Hive Fleet does Mortimer play. Uh, he started out playing Yormagunder, although he has a custom name for his Hive Fleet. He calls him Hive Fleet Cap Caprulu, I think, which is uh, taken from uh, Starcraft. I think the, um, what are the aliens in Starcraft? The Zerg come from the Caprulu sector, I think. So uh, he named his High Fleet High Fleet Caprulu, but he started out playing Yormagunder rules, and I try to get people to stick to their sub faction uh, in order to sort of make the campaign feel more consistent. 
but he has changed a few times. He uh, started out Yormagunder and then he switched to um, Kraken. And so I asked him if he could come up with like, like a sort of in-game explanation for that. And so what he came up with is that his high fleet basically goes through different phases as it's in invading a planet. So it goes through a sort of Yormagunder style phase where every all the Tyranids are like digging uh, tunnels and basically uh, digging in. And then once they're sort of fully dug in, they switch to a sort of extermination mode. And uh, then he used High Fleet Kraken where they are all sort of on crack, charging super fast and falling back and charging again, stuff like that. So I thought that worked uh, to explain uh, using multiple different high fleets to say that they're sort of going through a metamorphosis as they conquer a planet. And I think he's maybe played Yormagunder once after that uh, as well, but it's all right. I don't mind too much. Uh, you know, I feel like uh, it's more annoying if a Space Marine player is switching between Blood Angels and Salamanders and stuff like that. But you can also come up with lore explanations for that. I know that um, a famous Warhammer player on YouTube. Um, uh, oh, you've got it, Tamir. Um, to be fair, Nids adapt to the situation as they absorb local fauna. Yep, that makes sense. Kind of like the uh, aliens from the Aliens movies. They also absorb the DNA of whatever they gestate inside of. Uh, so there is players who have done the same thing with Space Marines and had it kind of make sense. Um, uh, Winters SEO does that with his 13th. They will uh, basically change their chapter tactics because they're masters of the Codex Astartes. They know all the tactics of all the chapters and they're able to uh, switch between them because they're such ex you know highly skilled warriors. So yeah, that could work too. But in general, I try to convince people to pick one and stick to it for the purpose of the narrative campaign, and usually most people are willing to do that. Although I have a feeling my uh, friend is going to want to play, um, uh, what's it, uh, there's like uh, one of the high fleets that's especially good for um, Crusher Stampede, Leviathan. I have a feeling he's going to want to play Leviathan with Crusher Stampede, because that's a pretty strong combo but uh it could could even just make sense to that uh you know when a bunch of the super big uh tyranid monsters get together they sort of uh like you say they they adapt all right well i think we got uh white done on this guy pretty well so i do uh i'm painting the sort of armor plates on my g sealers white and uh, it started with like a gray primer, so it worked pretty well where there's some shadowing in between the sort of armor plates and muscles. I'm wondering if I want to try to get uh, his toenails painted white. Um, I guess I might as well. Same color, but they're going to be kind of hard to hit. I can zoom in so you can see what I'm doing here. Uh, what happened next in the Icarus system was, uh, so I guess I got a roommate who uh, had played 40k before. Oh, let's see, Tamir. I think you could have done that with your Primaris add-on. Though Leviathan is pretty specific adaptation and is based on their neural networking ability. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I could have made like a custom chapter for my Primera since they don't use standard Dark Angel's armor color even. Could have. But I'm pretty loyal to the uh, Dark Angel's chapter. Loyalty is a trait of the Dark Angel's after all. Alright. Alright, there we go. Gonna try and hit this too. So I got a roommate who played uh, 40k in the past and he picked it up again and got a bunch of eBay models and painted them all. Uh, since we were living together, and he um, collected uh, Blood Angels and 
which was just kind of a small little skirmish for us. He only played those a couple times. And he collected Tau and he collected uh, High Fleet Tyranids. And since he had his own color scheme for his Tyranids that was different than uh, Mortimer's, it didn't quite make sense that they would be like the same High Fleet. So uh, we were like, oh, how can we incorporate a different uh, Tyranid High Fleet now that uh, we've already got this scout ship? So what we ended up going with was uh, uh, kind of inspired by my reading about the uh, planet Nibiru uh, theories that basically a planet from deep space was reappearing in the system. You know, it's on some kind of 10,000 year orbit and everyone in the star system is basically either never knew it was there or they've forgotten it was there. And now this planet is coming back from deep space and it's all like crusted in ice and swarming with Tyranids. So uh, we called it like Ice Planet X and the idea for uh, my friend Garrett's uh, Tyranids was that they were the Tyranids of the Ice Planet. And so it was part of a kind of a, a high fleet tendril kind of coming towards the system. And so we were going to fight games that were, you know, on the ice planet or else the Tyranids were, would be, you know, landing in spores and stuff like that to attack uh, other planets in the system. And I don't think we did any custom missions. I think by that point it was 8th edition. In Warhammer, uh, this is Tamir, in Warhammer you can also always use the local warp storm blocked off that area explanation. Yeah, that's a good one. Local warp storm. That could be an idea uh, for a campaign series too, uh, or for like a whole setting. Could be have your uh, battles taking place, or have your campaign setting be a system that's cut off by warp storms. That'd be cool. Well, I'm feeling like a pro painter here, doing some little toenails on this guy. <laughs> And fingernails. I guess I'm starting with the hard stuff and then we'll do his um, body. I feel like this batch painting these guys is going kind of slow. It's going to take a while. Maybe not. Here's where I made some mess ups earlier. Oh, what time is it? It's just only 8.30. I've been at this for an hour and a half. All right, I guess a little while. Maybe these guys will be a multi-day project. Uh, Tamir, I use that at least for a narrative setup. Don't know what I'll do with it though. Well, my advice for uh, starting your campaign is to make a map. Uh, I made a pretty simple map, although I did make it in Photoshop and tried to make it look cool. Uh, I basically had like the star, which of course doesn't really feature in the campaign, but uh, just to sort of show the order of the planets, kind of like a solar system map of our solar system, showing like the planets, you know, uh, in order, getting larger as they go up to gas giants and then uh, like one little Pluto type planet in the distance. And so I made like, I uh, named the system Icarus after the star and Part of the inspiration for that is that you have all these Icarus weapons in Warhammer 40k uh, and usually the Icarus weapons are like good at hitting air units. So I was thinking maybe the Icarus system is where either where they're manufactured or where the uh, maybe the STCs were discovered. So came up with the Icarus system, I thought that was a cool sounding name and uh, just to make it easy, name the planets Icarus 1, Icarus 2, Icarus 3, Icarus 4 for the four sort of like Earth type planets uh, or inner, what do they call them? Sort of inner system planets. And then uh, I guess I kept that up for the gas giant was Icarus 5 and then the furthest out kind of Pluto type planet was Icarus 6. But then um, for the moons of Icarus 5, the gas giant, um, I made up more interesting names. So Transcendence Moon and Rast. 
Rast Moon. So Rast uh, was like a Mechanicum uh, Forge Moon. Uh, Transcendence was uh, like a Shrine Moon, Garden World, Pleasure Planet, whatever. And then, um, uh, and then basically for each planet, I would uh, come up with a little list of features that were on it. That would be like locations that you could fight a battle over. So a lot of them had a, a spaceport or a planetary defense battery. Um, hives were a common feature. Uh, Icarus 1 was like an uninhabited planet. So I gave it a, what do you call it? A, a space hulk crash, a warp rift, and Xenos ruins. So... Uh, those are fun because you never know, like, uh, you know, whatever Xenos race someone ends up playing, they could say, oh, those are my ancient ruins. So uh, a lot of, in a lot of the cases, I was trying to leave the door open to, like, future developments. And then Icarus 2 was the um, Agra world. So I had an Agra world and a Forge world, some pretty classic uh, 40k planet types. And I had a... a um, Hive planet, Hive world, which was uh, Icarus 3. And it was kind of like a temperate, kind of Earth type planet with a lot of forests until it got uh, destroyed by um, Nurgle. But uh, basically, that, that would be my first step is make a map. And a map is an incredibly handy tool. And then. Um, more recently, I kind of remade the map to sort of update it uh, for like all the stuff that's happened since then. So now most of the planets are ruins. <laughs> so you've got like your, uh, it's still uninhabited Icarus 1, but uh, orcs have been uh, crashed there. And they basically used the scrap from the Space Hulk crash to build up a bunch of war machines and probably like a big orc settlement. And they're using it as a base to attack the rest of the system. Uh, but it's still uninhabited by Imperials. Uh, so Icarus 2 uh, was the um, Agra world, which is now like a feudal world, slowly building itself back up. And then Icarus 3 was the hive world, is now a forbidden world and a plague planet. What do you call it? I think there's some Nurgle term for it, like a, a Nurgle garden or something. But since it's been like no one's been there in a hundred years, who knows what it's like? So we haven't exactly returned to Icarus 3 to actually see or, you know, decide for sure what's there. So it's still kind of a mystery. But if somebody made a Nurgle army, that would be like a good good reason or a good location to have it set up. And then um, the moons, Rast Moon. At one point we decided uh, someone was playing Necrons. So we had Rast Moon had become uh, like a Necron tomb moon. It was like, you know, clearly it had been all along and just nobody knew. So eventually Necron started waking up there. The mechanic has delved too deep and awoken the Necrons, kind of like uh, the dwarves in um, uh, what's their city in um, the is it the Two Towers or is that no? It's Fellowship of the Ring, Moria, kind of like the dwarves in Moria. And since uh, we haven't really fought battles on Rast since the uh, you know in the last hundred years, don't know if the Necrons took over or if they're still just fighting to take over. Or maybe we have. I guess I've fought some games, but I guess we haven't decided to what extent the Mechanicus is still in operation on Rast. And then um, Transcendence, of course, is turned into like a Savage World slash Death World as it's become overrun with these sort of uh, Death World forests. And pretty much the only planet that like uh, War has not touched is uh, Icarus 6, which has got like a, uh, maybe it has come under attack once and it was successfully defended, but it has like a, a weapons depot and I think like a planetary defense um, battery and like a starport. 
basically the idea is Icarus 6 is kind of like the first place that Imperium forces would re-equip and resupply if they come into the system to reinforce it. And uh, we just fought our first ever game on Icarus 4 uh, yesterday. So this was against Mark's um, Templar of the Broken Shard. And um, uh, kind of, I did kind of with Mark what I basically do with most new players in the campaign, which is to show them the map and say, you know, hey, does this, you know, where do you think your forces would be or where would be a good place for us to fight over? And I uh, basically use the map as a tool to help inspire the narrative and to give new players kind of a uh, sense of the campaign setting. And it worked. You know, he, he ended up saying, well, he thinks that his Templar would be, uh, or where he wanted to, to fight would be Icarus 4, where there's a secret weapons lab. And I think part of it was that he um, maybe wanted to play somewhere that we haven't already played a bunch of games. And he actually picked up a desert map, a desert playing mat, in order to uh, better match the uh, narrative setting so that was really cool and it really it's really fitting for his te uh, Templar because basically they specialize in operating without Imperium support so having them be on a planet that doesn't have a lot of uh, you know interesting features to it is just fine kind of like an uninhabited desert world is is pretty much their jam and uh, when I asked him like uh, you know do you think you're troops just arrived here he was saying oh no i bet they've been here for like a long time so we're saying uh you know they've probably been there like a hundred years so basically his um templar primaris are the guardians of icarus 4 so that's what ended up coming out of the uh lore brainstorming for them and uh the inspiration for it was the campaign map so uh, i definitely recommend making a campaign map if you want to run a narrative uh, campaign and it can be a good uh, tool for introducing people to the campaign setting and helping to kind of brainstorm an idea for a game and uh, it just uh, keeps paying dividends you know um, for a fairly small amount of effort it's uh, been used a ton over the last uh, five years or so Kind of trying to do a mix of highlighting and dry brushing here. Don't know how well it's working, but getting through it. We're on um, aberrant four, uh, three out of five here with the white. Are you doing some uh, hobbying tonight, uh, Tamir? And I'm trying to remember if I've asked you already uh, what armies you play. I'd be curious to know. Said you're pretty new at 40k. I was trying to find where you said it, but I think you said you've been playing for a couple years. Uh, you say, uh, Tamir says, currently it's only narrative setup, not necessarily for a campaign. Oh, yeah. Well, I use campaign kind of loosely, but uh, basically I play all my at-home fun 40k match play games in the campaign setting. And uh, part of the key to it and making it last so long has been having the campaign setting kind of stay out of the way so it doesn't really influence the games too much. Uh, so that you, you, know, you don't really have to think about it if you don't want to, but... For the most part, it's made the games a lot more fun and exciting and engaging. And I'd say it's also motivated players to play, where not necessarily like they are trying to save the campaign world or uh, that they super care about it, but more like uh, by making the games a little more fun and kind of setting up some of these three game or five game series, it's kind of uh, motivated us that way.
another kind of fun way to play a series of games is to uh, do an escalation where you agree with your opponent we're going to play um, three games and then you increase the points from game to game so you start out with like a 500 point skirmish and then you uh, move up to like a 1000 point game and then you finish with like 2000 points for instance and that can be quite exciting uh, usually we'll do that where we uh, aren't allowed to remove units from the army between games like you can only add units or you could maybe remove up to two but everything else has to stay from game to game so you can do a little bit of getting rid of one or two things that you didn't like but for the most part you have to keep stuff from from uh, game to game so it feels like a real escalation of two armies getting more and more reinforcements kind of and I've enjoyed that I'd like to do that again but uh, right now we're playing all 1,000 point games in the setting uh, for uh, for live stream and the reason there is because uh, 1,000 points are easy to get done in about three hours and I feel like you don't want the live stream to go too incredibly long but definitely thinking it would be fun to get some 2,000 point games going in the future uh, especially like once we're playing quite quickly and if like say we're getting our 1,000 point games down to like two hours then I would definitely start to consider uh, getting some 2,000 point games on the stream. And I also have thought of maybe having like 2,000 point games as like subscriber only content and keeping the 1,000 point games for like the free content or something. Uh, definitely is a plan to have some kind of subscription service available for the channel in the future as a way to raise money. Uh, I would love to be able to devote more time to uh, streaming 40K and maybe even do some more like edited videos or videos that have more uh, sort of pre-planning and videos of the fact, uh, forces and stuff like that. But uh, right now I'm having to work a lot, so not a whole amount of time for that. Trying to get 40k in maybe two days a week though already. Hey Vorkash, welcome. Good to have you here. We've been talking about custom scenarios, custom missions, and just sort of generally about narrative play. And uh, let us know, have you played any uh, cool custom missions you want to tell us about? And I assume you play 40k, I'm trying to remember. Do I already know? I've probably already had you tell me this. And talking about uh, the narrative campaign that I've been playing and some of the memorable uh, campaigns and games and missions that we've done. Um, after uh, Transcendence Moon had kind of fallen to savagery, uh, my roommate uh, Garrett started his Tau army and the sort of uh, in-game lore for them that he came up with was that they had come to Transcendence Moon to colonize it. And so uh, Transcendence Moon had all these sort of, uh, sort of primitive cavemen living in it ever since the hives were overrun by Tyranids. So he was kind of like uh, fighting against the Dark Angels to sort of for control of the human population as they were either going to, you know, become colonists who were absorbed into the Tau Empire or defended by the Imperium, basically. And those are some interesting games. Let me think if I've, uh, if we did custom scenarios, though. I don't know that we did, but we definitely did set up some tables for the game inspired by that lore, where we would have kind of like a ring of tree houses in the middle of the table as like a village. Oh, Vorkash. Yeah, I've ran a few campaigns. And I was your opponent last night. Oh, okay. Good to see you. Welcome back. So this is Mark. And uh, I uh, I was telling uh, Tamir about our game last night, which was Orcs versus the Templar of the Broken Shard. 
and how you had chosen Icarus 4 as basically your uh, planet, uh, sort of almost like home planet for your faction, as you would be had been put in charge of defending the Imperial installation, the secret weapons lab on Icarus 4, and had been on this uninhabited planet for at least like a hundred years. Very cool. And uh, Tamir is getting his own uh, sort of campaign going, or I guess uh, more like developing a, a setting, but more doing it just for lore at the moment, not so much for a campaign. So Vorkesh, uh, do you have a, a very memorable uh, custom mission you've done before? Or do you have a fun idea for a custom mission um, maybe set on Icarus 4? I have been thinking a little bit about our next game and some possibilities for the future. Uh, one possibility I came up with was that uh, since the orcs are sort of launching their attacks from Icarus 1, which is an uninhabited planet with uh, Xenos ruins and a warp rift and the Space Hulk wreckage, which the orcs have been salvaging, maybe your uh, Templar would bring the fight to the orcs to go strike back at them on Icarus 1. Vorkesh says, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I've, run, I've written a great many custom missions. Oh, cool. And it was a blast yesterday. I agree. That was a very good uh, game. C uh, congratulations on your win. I feel lucky you didn't table me. You almost had me in turn five there. Uh, but a uh, big win for uh, Mark. I guess I don't want to spoil the score in case anyone's uh, watching this who hasn't, uh, who's, who's going to watch the game afterwards. As it is now up on YouTube, I uploaded our game from last night onto YouTube uh, uh, last night or this morning, maybe this morning. So that was fun. That's uh, just our second um, live stream game that's uh, up there. And I think the first one's already gotten some views. I'll have to check and see how it's doing. But very excited for the possible the future of our uh, live stream battle reports been something I've been wanting to do for quite a while and I don't know if I told you um, Vorkesh but my uh, New Year's resolution is to stream at least one game a month and I think we're gonna have maybe at least four or five in January well counting the one that um, didn't well maybe even not counting the one that didn't go so that's exciting So yeah, ideas for custom missions. Uh, one that we could reuse uh, if the if the orcs are ever able to find your secret weapons lab, could be interesting to do a mission where part of the battle is happening inside the lab, and part of the battle is happening outside the lab, something like that. Do like a split table, or a split board. Or just have like an entrance to an area on, on as part of the board could be interesting. And um, we could also think about doing like a multi-game series. If there's a scenario that would lend itself to it. Like maybe um, if you were going to attack Icarus 1 where the orcs have their uh, encampment. Could fight like... Uh, series of battles as you try to destroy the orc encampment do like a best of three or something that would be really fun uh also we could think about what the uh what sort of uh effect the secret weapons lab might have on the lore Currently, it's just been like something to protect, but um, you could imagine a secret weapons lab having something really shocking inside, or having some kind of effect on the campaign world. Maybe some kind of anti-Tyranid thing. So um, the 
Oh, Tamir, have you thought about a search and collect kind of mission? Where there are search markers on the map which can additional which can additionally to the mission objective lead to some positive or negative result? As you said, there's a lot of ruins, so they might hold something of strategic value. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so there are Xenos ruins on Icarus 1, and the orcs are super into uh, looting and uh, scavenging, and so are the Templars of the Broken Shard that Mark plays. So it could be interesting where the orcs and the Templars are competing to recover either scrap or uh, relics or something like that. Might go well with the new um, 2022 mission. Uh, there's actually two missions that sound kind of appropriate. One is like something like gather the relics. And I think one is find the relic and the other is something similar. But uh, yeah, we should look at those. Might be fun to play the 2022 missions since they've been released. Uh, two of them have been released as PDF. Oh, but they're probably for 2000 point game. I think that was why I didn't bring it up before. I don't think they're incursion missions. But we could always come up with an incursion mission that was inspired by them or uh, based on the idea of collecting or searching for stuff. Uh, I guess this is something I should ask. Uh, Mark, uh, Vorkesh, are you uh, more interested in um, playing a series of games set on Icarus 4, sort of the adventures of the Templar as they defend the planet against a variety of threats? Or would you be more interested in having them branch out and go jetting around the campaign system, attacking, uh, the, bringing the fight to the orcs or uh, fighting on other planets? Because I could think either one would be cool. And um, the fact that you got a custom, like a desert battle mat for Icarus 4 uh, does make me want to see it um, in action multiple times, especially because your army looks great on it. But um, the secret weapons lab might have something that would be effective against the uh, Tyranid cultists on Transcendence. Basically, the um, Tyranid cults have been controlling the hives on Transcendence Moon for about a hundred years. Might be interesting if the Secret Weapons Lab were actually working on dealing with them. Plus, I'm going to have my new Gene Stealer Cult Codex in probably another week. And uh, the Gene Stealer Cults could also arrive on Icarus 4. I imagine they've got access to some kind of space transport now as they did just um, try to send some infected medical supplies to Icarus 2. Maybe uh, maybe a ship full of gene stealer cultists could land on Icarus 4 and the Templar of the Broken Shard have to deal with the potential of uh, gene stealer cultists discovering the secret weapons lab while at the same time the lab is working on some kind of anti-gene stealer virus or something. Could be cool. Oh, Tamir got his uh, codex yesterday, cool. Forkesh says, fluff all the way, love a good campaign story. Well, the fact that you've come up with uh, some campaign stuff like that before uh, definitely is cool. Um, makes me think that I want you to Spend some time thinking of more ideas for us. I've been really enjoying Gene Stealer cults. So the Cult of Transcendence has started on uh, Transcendence Moon. And uh, at the beginning, they were probably just a few cultists living in the sewers, hiding out somewhere. Maybe just a, you know, a few people hiding their infections. But then when uh, Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade uh, bombarded the planet and bombed the hives, all of the, uh, basically the majority of the hive populations tried to evacuate. And they all went to this one spaceport where they were all boarding these evacuation shuttles to leave the planet. And 
then uh, in a battle between Dark Angels and Black Legion, uh, Black Legion Chaos Space Marines managed to capture the cockpits of all the escape craft and basically just abduct all the uh, population that was trying to evacuate aboard their own ac uh, evacuation shuttles. So uh, the Black Legion got, uh, you know, probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of uh, raw recruits or victims or slaves in that uh, one battle. It was a culmination of a uh, three game set or no five game set, I think. And then, um, and then after that, basically the hives had been abandoned. The few people who stuck behind, some of them were infected with the gene sealer uh, virus. So since then it's spread totally out of control. The hives have been overrun with millions or, you know, again, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of gene stealers. And, uh, They've basically had their run of the whole moon for a hundred years. And now they're starting to become a problem elsewhere around the system. <clears throat> uh, Vorkesh says, if you want, I would have a blast writing you special missions. Yeah, totally. We should write some special missions for, uh, uh, for your Templars fighting against my orcs. Um, or actually you have a variety of factions. So all your factions and all my factions. I've got uh, Drukari and Gene Stealer Cult, besides the orcs who totally would be great uh, antagonists for your uh, Templar of the Broken Shard. And then it'll be fun to get my um, Planetary Defense Force off the ground. That's going to be my Imperial Guard. They, uh, one of the helicopters I'm going to use for them arrived is a Russian hind attack helicopter and I got it in like 148 scale which is actually a tad big for Warhammer uh, just a little big but uh, it's nice because the seats the cockpit seats actually will fit a uh, Imperial Guard pilot from like a Valkyrie or a, a, actually no he's from a, a what's that little scout walker uh, that they have armored sentinel I have uh, some Sentinel pilots, uh, Imperial Guard pilots, so I might put in the hind. So that's exciting. I uh, don't know when I'll have a chance to build it. Maybe, maybe next week. I'm actually building up a few kits uh, that need to be built, which is kind of rare for me. I have a uh, uh, Storm Speeder Hammer Strike I want to make, and a Drukari Void Raven Bomber and that hind attack helicopter so kind of a lot uh, looks like i probably want to have um screamer pink on these uh exposed musculature on the back but yeah i would totally let you write some custom missions that would be cool vorkesh uh, tamir uh or on a way to delete the connection to the hive mind could be lead to the later full independence of those gene stealers, allowing for a narrative gene stealer versus NID games, yeah. Or even just for having NIDs in the system and the gene stealers not being uh, immediately taken over. Uh, the sort of lore explanation I used for the gene stealer um, cult being independent previously was that there was um, the Tyranid scout ship and then also a uh, Tyranid planet, sort of ice planet, uh, approaching the system, and the idea that those were two different hive fleets, and that their sort of hive minds were kind of battling over who would control the uh, Gene Sealer cult, and that probably at times one or the other would actually hold sway over the cult, and they would all become mind controlled by the hive mind, but then the other hive mind might fight it back and they would sort of regain their free will as neither one is able to fully control them. That was kind of the lore explanation I had so far for why they hadn't been totally absorbed yet. But uh, yeah, that's a good point. If um, the secret weapons lab developed some kind of weapon that could sever the connection to the hive mind, 
that might kind of free the cult to continue operating. Sort of like uh, it's intended to destroy them, but instead it gives them free will kind of thing. Unintended consequences. Uh, so yeah, the uh, Tau landed on um, Icarus, or no, on Transcendence, and started to colonize it. And I did have another uh, guy play a few games with us who played like a Space Wolf uh, successor chapter, which was kind of like um, tiger themed, tiger stripes on the armor and stuff like that. And one of the features of Transcendence Moon is that it used to have a an Imperial Shrine that was the responsibility of the Dark Angels to protect. And Abaddon actually conquered it and desecrated the shrine during the Black Crusade, at which point the Dark Angels abandoned their duty to, to defend it after, you know, losing the battle. And they chose to pursue uh, Abaddon's fleet rather than stay behind and clean up. And as a result, that, um, that shrine on Transcendence has basically been lost to time. And so uh, I think uh, some of the games that we played with him was where he was looking for the shrine and he had found it and was trying to like retake it basically. And then we had a team up game that was kind of fun. But uh, <laughs> my dark angels held back and shot while his uh, space wolves ran forward and all got killed. So he ended up with kind of a grudge against me, which was kind of fitting to the uh, Dark Angel and um, sp uh, Space Wolf lore. Always funny when life imitates art, you know, and you end up uh, having something from the lore kind of happen naturally in your own games. And sometimes we just play good, good old match play with a random mission just set in the setting and just pick a planet to fight over. That's kind of the fallback. All right, well, we got some white on these guys. I guess I forgot to do his fingernails. Let's do those now. We're on camera, yeah. So let me think about what else Forkesh said he plays. He plays uh, Imperial Knights. So that could be interesting. I feel like Imperial Knights would make the most sense on Icarus 2, the Agra world, or on Rast, the Forge world, or potentially even on Transcendence. Could be fun to see Imperial Knights on the table. Uh, my Drukhari are sort of the focused on collecting rare exotic beasts and poisons and that kind of thing. So they quite like uh, Transcendence because it's a sort of overgrown death world jungle. Lots of stuff for them to harvest. Uh, Tamir, knight armies are an interesting army concept. Yeah. Um, Vorkesh, have you thought at all about the sort of lore of your knight house? I bet you have. I love how you had names for all your sergeants and stuff in our game uh, yesterday. That was really fun. Oh yeah, Vorkesh plays ni uh, knights, necrons, tau, and space marines. So it could be really cool to see uh, necrons emerging from their tombs on ra uh, Rast Moon. Uh, or maybe, it, uh, maybe they've... Um, brought the battle to another planet in the system now or maybe there's a um, a tomb on another uh, planet that's uh, waking up Tamir says yay for the Necrons <laughs> uh, I also have a friend Mark who plays another friend Mark actually who also plays Necrons so they could either be both from uh, happening on Rast or they could both be uh, emerging on different planets or arriving in the system from somewhere else even. Painting stuff I missed the first time with the uh, Screamer Pink here, so 
his toes are sticking out of his boot, which is kind of a cute little detail I missed the first time I was painting this color. Are you guys doing hobby stuff tonight? Now let's do the stuff on his back. Big news for Vorkash is he just got a, a huge uh, Titan. I want to say, uh, was it a Warlord Titan? Or was it one step down from a Warlord? Super exciting, though. You'll have to think about where uh, where in the setting each of your armies would be located, Vorkash. The knights have a scavenger look to them as well. They are themed to match my space marines. Well, what if they're? Uh, what if your knights are also defending the secret weapons lab against bigger, badder threats? Like um, it's uh, holding something so important that uh, both. A uh, space marine chapter and a uh, night house are placed in defense of it. I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, you know, it might make sense that um, that this uh, secret weapons lab is some vast underground facility with giant caverns big enough for flyers to fly through uh, through the vaults. That would be pretty cool give us a, a sort of a expanded setting to battle on on that planet. Uh, so you've got, uh, so you also have Tau. Oh, you said you're working on your Tau, right. Uh, Tau uh, could always be arriving in the system as a colonizer fleet. That's always an easy uh, explanation for Tau. Then you could like pick a planet that they're gonna mostly focus on maybe. Or perhaps they have the plan to colonize one planet after another through the whole system. So it would be like we could play some some series for each uh, planet that they attack as they sort of test the defenses on various planets. That would give me a good reason to play my uh, planetary defense force if the uh, tower trying to colonize Icarus 2 and then my uh, Imperial Guard are the PDF trying to defend it. That would be fun. Uh, this guy has some kind of uh, armor on him, which I'd normally paint black. Uh, looks like maybe his pant leg comes to an end and he's got like a knee, bare knee. So I think I'll paint that white. So Vorkesh says, um, my Necrons are merging with Eldar Metal and our living metal of the Necrons are taking over the Eldar host. Ooh, interesting. Uh, and then it is a Warlord Titan. Super cool. How many points is a Warlord Titan? I have a feeling that um, I might have enough points to go against it if I play a full army. And Vorkesh says, they might emerge from the lab as we gathered new supplies, curious of the orcs. Yeah, if you wanted to strike back against the orcs, you could do that on Icarus 1, where they have their base of operations, or on Icarus 2, where they're waging a, a, a current siege. Tamir, or they try to establish contact with the survivors on the moon, and that goes wrong and spirals into a full-drawn conflict. I wonder uh, where the Necrons are going to be. Oh, the Tau, okay. I wonder if the Necrons will be uh, on Rast or on another planet. Okay, so Vorkash says 5,500 points. Well, now I have something to do on my overnight shift this week. I can add up my complete armies and see uh, what I've got. Uh, so, so my Gene Stealer cult probably could have done that, but I've been changing some of it into Planetary Defense Force. Uh, I'll still be able to use the uh, Bane Blade for either either army, so uh, it's possible I could be close to that with Gene Seer Cult. Uh, I don't think so. I bet my Gene Seer Cult is closer to 3,500, honestly. 
And my orcs, they're getting up there. I have a feeling my orcs are about 4,000 now. Uh, Tamir, I kind of wish the Gene Stealer cult had flyers. Oh, I know, man. Uh, I was actually going to have these helicopters be uh, Vendetta gunships uh, or Vulture gunships for my Gene Stealer cult brood brothers, and now I think they've made it so they can't be. So I think the Gene Stealer cult went from being able to take uh, Imperial Guard flyers to now they can only take uh, Tyranid flyers in an allied detachment. Uh, as far as I know, they can still ally with Hive Fleet Tyranids. So I think that's the only way for them to get flyers from now. Unless I'm mistaken. Or Titanics. Imagine one of the giant uh, wheel digging machines as a Titan. Oh, interesting. I did see somebody who did a, a Bane Blade as a mining vehicle. Uh, what's his name? Grant, uh, Adam Smith, something Smith uh, on uh, Facebook. Uh, in the Gene Seer cult group, he does some amazing conversions. Very inspiring. Inspired me to do some converted uh, vehicles, mining vehicles. All right, well, I got some white paint there. Uh, I think we should try and get a uh, highlight on the pink skin now. Uh, yep, that's right, Tamir, but uh, the selection of what you could bring as Brood Brothers has been reduced. So no more Ogrins or Bulgrins or Vendetta Gunships, I think. Tamir, I haven't unwrapped the Codex yet as I'm currently redoing my floor and have everything in boxes. Well, what I've heard about uh, Brood Brothers is that um, uh, the only... Uh, Astro Militarum units that can be taken as Brood Brothers now are those that have the Regiment keyword or Unaligned. So I'm pretty sure that means no Ogrin, no Bulgrin, no Astropaths, no Flyers. Um, like all that stuff's out. Uh, Tamir, I would also really, uh, I also would really like would be Gene Stealers and Terminator armor. <laughs> uh, that would be interesting, huh? Uh, I gotcha. What you would really like, yeah. All right, well, let's try and get some light pink on the skin on these guys. Uh, kind of going for just a quick wet brush. I'd call it a dry brush, but my paint is literally a bit wet. So, just trying to give it a little bit of a highlight, and then there, we're going to come along with a uh, crimson wash eventually on the skin to darken it up. I'm thinking we're not going to get through these guys, because I'm kind of tired. I don't think I'll be able to do two more hours is probably what it would take. Might have to finish them up tomorrow. Of course, tomorrow I'll probably have lots of time because uh, I think we don't have anything super serious for construction. <laughs> Vorkesh says that would be really cool. Uh, I, I did a couple polls of like what Gene Sealer cult units should there be or like uh, I remember one poll I conducted on Facebook was like, what if Gene Sealer Cults had as many units as Space Marine Codex? What would be some things you'd like to see? And um, I think top voted was like uh, some like Melta Troopers in like the kind of fireproof armor that you have like industrial suits for uh, working at like a forge. Thought that would be fun. Melta blaster teams in fireproof suits. <laughs> but uh, there were a lot of fun ideas like a giant crane. And uh, another one I um, in another poll was what flyer should Gene Sealer cults have? And there were some interesting ideas there like a flying dump truck or a civilian plane that's been like up armored with extra guns bolted to it. 
helicopter, which was kind of what I was going for with my Brood Brothers. A lot of fun ideas. Well, let's try to get these little bits on the back. Uh, yeah, here's where my paint's a little too wet for this. It's kind of going into the crevices. But that's okay. The ink wash will kind of fix that. Helicopters so the deaf coptas would make more sense. Yeah, that's right, Tamir. Where did the orcs get the idea for deaf coptas? There's like basically no other helicopters in the game. Well, that's one of the fun things about Warhammer is that you can have your own idea for a unit and create your own model. It goes all the way back to the infamous uh, deodorant stick land speeder and some of the early tanks in Rogue Trader era were also kit, kit bashes or home brew, uh, scratch builds. And I've, I've been doing quite a bit of scratch building myself. Uh, it was something I started doing mostly for my orcs. And I actually got Plastic Hard and learned how to scratch build uh, vehicles out of Plastic Hard. That's been a fun adventure. Well, um, I am getting a little tired. I'm thinking that we'll just uh, do this sort of light pink on all five models, and then we'll probably call it for the tonight's stream. And uh, I think I'll be finishing these tomorrow. I was thinking it was a bit ambitious to do them all in one sitting, but maybe if we uh, get them done quickly tomorrow, I'll start the uh, second group of five. I've got five with the huge hammers, and I've got five with the uh, picks, power picks. And the leader has the improvised weapon. So those would be fun, and they should go pretty quick since I'll be painting them the same style as these. Maybe I could finish batch painting these. Oh, well, let's see. If these are taking more than one session, I probably will take more than one on them too. So maybe it would be a whole week spent painting aberrants. <laughs> but uh, perhaps I could um, include the abominant in the batch session tomorrow and then this week manage to get all 10 of these uh, aberrants plus the abominant painted. That would be good. That would be some real progress. These guys have been sitting on my desk for about three weeks now, so definitely excited to get them done and on the table. Plus to have the new codex. Very exciting for me. I've been really on an orc kick uh, playing, but uh, I'm missing my Gene Sealer Cults. They were kind of my favorite faction to play right up until I got into orcs. Oh, Vorkesh says my daughter is uh, going to start a uh, Gene Stealer uh, cult. That's cool. How fun. Uh, Tamir says someone I know recently kit bashed an Admech Dune Strider into a Death Dread. Ooh, that's cool. So many fun kit bashes you could do with orcs as they love to loot anything in the universe, basically. To be fair, orcs have been around long enough so that some ancestral orc picked them up. Oh, from helicopters, yeah. Uh, I, someone mentioned uh, something about uh, the uh, somewhere in the 40k lore, there's some kind of uh, vehicle or spacecraft or something that has, says CCP or something on it, like it's uh, from the Soviet Union. I thought that was quite funny and then like no but it was so ancient that no one remembered what the acronym stood for so that maybe that's some lore uh backup for my using uh russian attack helicopters <laughs> very loose 
Um, shoot, this is really watery. I guess I just got to be careful. Well, um, I, I guess if you guys have any other ideas for um, custom missions, custom scenarios, it's kind of the uh, topic today. It'd be fun to give people any other um, advice or ideas or inspiration that we have uh, while we're thinking about it. I would say that um, it is pretty easy to make your own missions for 9th edition. Basically, you need... Hey, we got a new follower. Welcome. Oh, it's Tamir. And we also have another follower. I want to give a shout out to Jenny Joy O. Uh, she subscribed just before, um, or she followed just before the stream started. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, as far as making your own mission for 9th edition, uh, pretty much you need to figure out what your deployment zones are going to be. And the most basic is long edges. And then there's also short edges, or you could do table quarters. And there's also the interesting diagonal ones. Um, those can be fun, but I think they're the most annoying to set up. And then you have to figure out uh, if you're gonna be, I guess how many objectives you wanna have on the table. And if you only have four objectives or less, then you probably want to have your primary mission be hold one, hold two. Whereas if you have like five or more, then you're probably going to want to pick hold two, hold three as your primary. And then you could think about mission special rules. Uh, some missions do have some special rules. Like I've seen um, on forward push, uh, if your advance roll is less than a three, count it as a three, for instance. Um, and then I think, oh yeah, we had a special rule in our mission last night, um, Mark. It was uh, you get an extra command point if during your command phase you're holding one of your opponent's uh, objectives in their deployment zone. And we forgot to do that when you were holding mine on turn four or five, but the game was pretty decided by that point. Uh, so think about uh, if you want to have a special rule and then what is your um, special secondary going to be and that could be a little bit harder to figure out but basically if you've read enough secondary um, objectives in the rule book and the grand tournaments and the mission secondaries it shouldn't be too hard to make up your own and it is like an extra bit of flavor that you can add to your mission. I guess there's like a secondary or a special rule where you can raise objectives in one of them. Or is that a uh, mission secondary where you raise objectives? Basically you destroy them. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for making uh, custom missions in ninth edition and i would be totally down to play some that you designed vorkesh oh tamir you gotta go all right you have a great rest of the night thanks for stopping in it was really fun chatting with you and good luck with your uh campaign um or your uh at least your narrative setting that you're working on all right that's three guys highlighted we got just two left We'll see if we can do this pretty quick. Are you doing some hobbying tonight, uh, Vorkesh? Probably ought to be working on your Titan <laughs> every day till it's done. Or you're working on your Tau, or just enjoying a chill night. I was doing uh, construction in the rain all day today, so I'm pretty wiped. And uh, tomorrow should be a lot easier. Hopefully it doesn't rain as much. Just doing a, um, like a gutter maintenance tomorrow and installing some screen on a gutter, so 
Gonna get some exercise, climbing up and down a ladder with my tool belt. Got a lot of exercise today. The tool belt's pretty heavy, so pretty much just walking around, you get a workout. Oh, Vorkash is stuck at work. Oh, no. <laughs> well, thanks for listening to me at work. That's awfully kind of you. Appreciate the support. And especially having you join the uh, team to play games. That's been awesome. Every, actually, everybody who's come up to play has been super cool. And um, uh, you said you're retired military? I've also got... Um, an active duty military player uh, that's um, Dominic and he's getting ready to I think deploy to England in a, in this year so he's not going to be around too much longer and then we got German he's been very fun to play against very great sport uh, he uh, beat me soundly in his for in our first game uh, with his sisters versus my orcs and then I tabled him in turn four in our second game and then you uh, almost tabled me in our game last night so it's been very like uh, good competition I think uh, if we can improve the quality consistently improve the quality of the streams to make them look better and better uh, we're gonna have some really great uh, player pool to draw from and we've got quite a few other players who I want to get on on the stream as well. Uh, my friends, uh, I have another friend, Mark. Oh, Titan won't be uh, done for a long while. I'm going to convert it to a Lucius pattern, Warlord Titan. Interesting. Oh, and you're not retired yet, but seven years served. Wow, thank you for your service to the country. I have a, kind of a military tradition in my family. I haven't served, but my dad was in... Uh, the tank corps and my uncle served in Vietnam he was a special forces advisor in Vietnam and he's the one who wrote a letter to the Secretary of Defense suggesting that the army switch to camouflage uniforms and he got a letter back saying that uh, they liked his idea and they were going to adopt his idea as soon as they used up all their um, olive drab brown they were going to start uh, switch to uh, camouflage so that's kind of a cool claim to fame and um, I have a uh, grandpa who is at D-Day my grandpa Bert was serving in the Canadian Navy uh, during World War II and so uh, he was part of the um, convoy escorts of the merchant ships bringing supplies to England and then at D-Day, he was on board a minesweeper, uh, clearing mines out of the water so that the troop ships could make it to the beaches. And he said uh, they were so close to the beach that even at two in the morning, they could see the German artillery guns against the night sky. And uh, he saw some really badly damaged ships that day during the fighting. And they almost got blown up. Uh, my grandpa's uh, mine sweeping ship was uh, uh, spotted, I guess, uh, two mines straight ahead of it. And the captain steered the ship in between the two mines and they scraped along the sides of the boat without going off. So talk about a close call. I assume they were magnetic mines and his uh, mine sweeping ship was a wooden ship, I think. But, uh, and then I think his, uh, I guess my grandma's brother, Thor Ronningen, uh, was, uh, fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, he was in a battalion commanded by someone named Butler, and, uh, they really, um, held out during the Battle of the Bulge and fought some important battles protected the allied uh, flank from being broken through I guess and I read his um, war memoir which is called Butler's Batlin Blue Bastards and it was really entertaining and gave me some real appreciation for what they went through especially uh, before the Battle of the Bulge like you know surviving a whole winter 
in a foxhole while uh, getting shelled by German artillery. It sounded horrible. And his unit suffered really bad casualties too, especially once they entered uh, Germany. Uh, Vorkesh, so I will be buying the Shadow Throne box so my daughter can start Gene Stealer Cult, so I get a bonus Custodes army with it. <laughs> That's funny. Cool. Great box. Looks fun. Also like the look of that new Eldar one with the Chaos uh, Chosen. That looks fun. I've never played Chaos as, and played as a Chaos army, um, but I, I have thought of it from time to time. I went to uh, work with a guy who was also thinking about playing Chaos, and he came up with a very cool kind of army theme, which was that they would be kind of like renegades, not exactly worshippers of Chaos, and that they would scavenge their equipment from both Astartes and Chaos Warriors. So he's going to, I think he was going to kitbash maybe Space Wolves and Chaos Space Marines. And that sounded like it would look pretty cool. Oh, man. Well, I am sore. Uh, well, we made some pretty good progress on these guys. Um, let me go ahead and throw them on the spinner and you can see how they're looking. Well, here's our uh, day one progress on these guys. The Gene Stealer Cult Aberrants. There we go. And let's try to get it to focus on the close ones. And looking forward to finishing these guys up tomorrow. I think it won't take too long. Um, what do they need? Uh, their weapons, probably mostly silver. Uh, I could always come back later and add some like object source lighting on their little uh, core of their hammer. Looks like it has a glowy bit in there. But what's left besides that? I guess a crimson ink wash on the skin. And on the white armor plates, I'll probably do just a little bit of watered down seraphim sepia to dirty it up a bit. And then they have some robes uh, or loincloths or pants. Uh, those I'll probably just leave gray and hit them with a brown wash, uh, some Agrax Earth Shade. And, um, and then the leader has some like black armor on one leg. So not too much left to paint. Definitely gonna be able to get them done tomorrow, but uh, I'm just about out of steam tonight. Painted for about two hours and 40 minutes, so feel good about that. Vorkesh, thanks so much for joining the chat again. And uh, Tamir, thanks for stopping by earlier. And uh, Jenny Joy, thanks for uh, following. And if you guys are watching this later on YouTube, leave us a like and uh, subscribe to the channel. And uh, check out our next live stream game of Warhammer planned for this Saturday, uh, Pacific time, probably aiming for about uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock. So thank you everybody and see you next time.